Is Christianity dangerous? It has been called the bloodiest religion in all human history, even compared to Islam. I'm going to stop you right there, because I'm going to need a source for that claim. Who said Christianity is the bloodiest religion? When the Washington Times asked which religion is the most violent, they noted that Christians caused 50 times more violent deaths than Muslims just over the last century. Okay, so that's a vague reference. But let's see what we can find. After searching, I think this is the article from 2013 that Arne is referring to. But it isn't written by an historian, and it doesn't conclude Christianity is the bloodiest religion. The author essentially covers how people in all religions have been violent. He even says, Atheists have no room to gloat. Pol Pot, Joseph Stalin, and Mao Zedong tallied tens of millions of kills between them in the 20th century alone. The absence of a religion is no more protection against fanatical rampages than blind faith. Then he essentially ends with the conclusion that atrocities committed by groups like the IRA do not represent what Catholicism is. He says the most violent religion on earth is any that have people in them. No matter what religion teaches, some bloody-minded believers will twist it to justify their own dark urges. This is hardly a conclusion that Christianity is the bloodiest religion. The article does cite another article to claim that Christians have killed 50 times more people than Muslims. But when you click on it, one notices this is not what the second article is claiming. It says people of Christian heritage have killed more than Muslims, which is vaguely defined. It includes atrocities committed by the USSR and Nazi Germany. Two regimes that rejected Christianity, one being atheist and the other perverting Christian symbols to fit Nazi ideology. Since our and most atheists today come from a culture of Christian heritage, they would be included in this category. This article only lists correlations of war with Christian heritage. It does nothing to show the correlations are meaningfully related to Christian doctrines and beliefs, let alone that Christianity is the cause of all this war and violence. Now, this is actually an empirical claim that can be put to the test. If Christianity directly leads to war, it should show up in social scientific research. So let's see what the research says on this topic. Is Christianity the bloodiest religion? Does it lead to more war and violence? In 2017, a study looked at the influence of religion on interstate armed conflict between 1946 and 2002. Specifically, it looked at the influence Islam, Christianity, and Buddhism have on initiating an armed conflict. After running three different models and robustness tests, it was found that Islam is positively correlated with interstate armed conflict initiation. Buddhism is neither positively nor negatively correlated, but Christianity is negatively correlated with armed conflict initiation. A state with a median non-zero Christian GRP is 37% less likely to initiate an interstate armed conflict than a state with no Christian GRP. A state with the maximum Christian GRP is 54% less likely. A state with a non-zero median Christian GRP is 60% less likely to initiate a fatal armed conflict than a state with no Christian GRP. A state with the maximum Christian GRP is 73% less likely. The study argued that the more influence Christianity has on a government, society, and education, the less likely it is to resort to interstate conflict. So far from promoting conflict and violence, it seems Christianity may contribute to a reduction in war and violence. Another study looked at the willingness for individuals to fight in territorial disputes across 56 countries. It found, consistent with existing studies among demographic controls, female respondents, religious affiliation, and college degree are negatively correlated with the willingness to fight. So drawing from multiple countries with heavy Christian influence, it was found that religiosity correlates with a lack of willingness to fight in territorial disputes. Looking at individuals directly, across 59 countries, it was found frequency of prayer importance of religion and importance of God were negatively related to justification of violence. Only frequency of service attendance and justification of violence had a positive relationship. Results undermine the constructivist argument for religion as a cause of violence. Similarly, researchers performed three separate studies. Two of them focused on Christians. 
and utilized priming methods to achieve results. It was found that intrinsic religiosity predicts less support for intergroup hostility, in that priming of intrinsic religiosity decreased intergroup hostility under mortality salience. When intrinsic religiosity was primed, mortality salience significantly decreased support for hostile counterterrorism in comparison with control conditions. It is related to decreased support for intergroup violence in times of threat. A 2021 study looked at a sample of over 270,000 adult respondents and found that importance of religious beliefs and influence of religious beliefs were inversely correlated to perpetration of self-directed aggression. Systematic reviews and meta-analyses have found that religiosity in mostly Western and Christian countries is inversely related to violence and nonviolent crimes. Additional research shows religiosity also corresponded with lower levels of direct and indirect aggression. Greater religiosity was associated with higher levels of compassion and self-control. Intrinsic religiosity was associated with lower levels of seeking vengeance and positively associated with more peaceful and compassionate values. Additionally, the Institute for Economic and Peace publishes a fairly exhaustive yearly report on terroristic acts around the world and includes links to ideologies. Christianity rarely shows up as a blip on their radar year after year, and no evidence has been presented that Christianity is ever a cause of terrorism. The Encyclopedia of Wars lists 1,763 historical conflicts, and in the index only classifies 122 of them as religious, which can even be disputed as we will get to later in this video. The overwhelming amount of data indicates religiosity and specifically Christian religiosity, leads away from violence and war, instead of being a cause of violence and war. So to claim Christian beliefs, doctrines, or rituals are a major cause of war and conflict is to go against what the scientific data is indicating. But don't some people still claim Christianity as their reason for violence? Often people on the fringe have cited a Bible verse or used Christianity as a reason or justification for war and violence. Surely we cannot ignore these instances. But this doesn't necessarily mean Christianity is the actual cause and may only be a post hoc justification. As one paper put it, insurgent political violence has been conducted in the name of any number of beliefs, including religion, human rights, freedom, and preferred forms of economic organization. That these various rationales are employed does not tell us whether the beliefs themselves, the tenets of religion, democracy, freedom, actually cause people to go to war, or whether they are merely epiphenomenal post hoc rationales to justify intergroup violence. In other words, merely claiming Christianity caused violence because a perpetrator claimed this doesn't necessarily make it so. One needs more data to show a causal link or a meaningful correlation. And as we covered, the data does not indicate Christianity leads to war and violence. Joshua David Wright and Yuli Ku studied this issue more and note that wherever evidence links specific aspects of religion with aggression and violence, these aspects are not unique to religion. Rather, these aspects are religious variants of more general psychological processes. They note many of the factors that make religious individuals violent are not unique to religion, but common elements of human nature that manifest in multiple ideologies. One of the main features unique to religions, the belief in the supernatural, is actually associated with reduced aggression and violence. Fundamentalist thinking, which is often positively associated with hostility, can be associated with both religious and secular groups. Aspects which can be characteristics of all groups or ideologies, such as social identity, coalitional commitment, dogmatism, moral certainty, binding motivations, and obedience to authority are motivators that are more likely to be associated with violence and war, and are not symptoms of religion specifically, but human psychology in general. These factors can latch onto religions and religious thinking. In other words, it appears other motivators are more likely to cause the violence associated with religion. Aspects of religion that focus on the supernatural or doctrinal issues, including factors such as prayer, reading scripture, holding to the tenets of a faith, appear to reduce violence, not increase it. As two researchers note, 
Differences in religious creed are rarely, if ever, genuine causes of violent clashes in and between nations, and that religious communities usually live in peace, understood as the absence of civil unrest or war, as long as the society as a whole prospers. This is an important point, because when it comes to historical conflicts, researchers often note it is very hard to separate religious from political or cultural motivators behind any war or conflict. This is the point raised by William Cavanaugh in his book The Myth of Religious Violence. There is no war that could ever be said to be purely caused by religion. All wars or conflicts have drawn from multiple factors that end up leading to violence. It is almost impossible to separate out religion as ever being the main cause of any conflict. Cavanaugh notes one of the main problems is it is incredibly hard to ever define what a religion is or where to distinctly draw the line between religion and other overlapping ideologies. The very concept of religion is a modern category. Religion as we understand it is not how the ancients used the word. The word derives from a Latin word that meant a powerful requirement to perform some action. You could have family or civil obligations that would have qualified as religion. Religion in ancient Rome was not about theological or philosophical beliefs, but actions one had to perform. This is why James refers to religion as the act of caring for the fatherless and widows. For St. Augustine, religion was not theological doctrines or beliefs, but virtues, actions, and true and proper worship of the one God. To quote, religion is something which is displayed in human relationships, in the family, in the narrower, in wider sense, in between friends. And so the use of the word does not avoid ambiguity when the worship of God is in question. In the Middle Ages, the various Catholic orders were seen as different religions because they were seen as different ways of worshiping God, even though we see them all as Christian. According to Thomas Aquinas, religion was not theological beliefs, but moral acts in worship of the one true God. It wasn't until a few centuries later, after the rise of Protestantism, that religion came to mean a specific sense of internalized beliefs and theological doctrines. This concept was invented in the West and then thrust upon the rest of the world. The problem was, is that many things which are classified as religion don't really meet the requirements, as many ideologies and ways of life that we classify as religion are nothing like Christianity in terms of being a set of doctrines and beliefs about the nature of reality and humanity. Kavanaugh notes scholars have attempted to define what a religion is in two different ways. The first is to define a religion in a substantivist way. Which is to say what makes something a religion is if its focus is on gods or some sense of transcendence of the physical world. The problem is this would exclude things like Confucianism and many traditional pagan religions, since the gods were not transcendent. Jan Bremer writes, The gods of the Greeks were not transcendent, but directly involved in natural and social processes. Also, do we include animism, which does not divide things into natural and things beyond the natural? If transcendence is defined more broadly, it will begin to include things that are not religions, like nationalism. Timothy Fitzgerald has pointed out, transcendent notions can include the nation, the land, the principles of humanism, the ancestors, communism, Atman Brahman, the goddess of democracy and human rights, cold speech, enlightenment, and various quite different senses, the right to private property, witchcraft, destiny, the immaculate conception. William Cavanaugh says, Defining religion in terms of the transcendent, or the sacred, or the supernatural, or the super-empirical, or any such terms, just begs the question as to what those terms mean. Trying to define religion in terms of this way results in many problems. So instead, many try to define religion in the second way, which is the functionalist definition. Timothy Fitzgerald says, Functionalists prefer to define religion, not in terms of what is believed by the religious, but in terms of how they believe it, that is in terms of the role belief plays in people's lives. Certain individual or social needs are specified and religion is identified as any system whose beliefs, practices, or symbols serve to meet those needs. The problem here is that the functionalist definitions are so broad they must include things like nationalism, patriotism, Freudianism, or Marxism. Within functionalist parameters, a U.S. District Court judge ruled that Alcoholics Anonymous is a religion. David Lloyd can write, 
This paper will argue that our present economic system should also be understood as our religion, because it has come to fulfill a religious function for us. Robert Bella wrote, The civic rituals of American life are a religion in this sense. See, religion has been notoriously difficult to define, because either we define religion too broadly and include so many ideologies that we're no longer talking about what people mean when they speak of a religion, or we define it too narrowly and exclude things like Buddhism, Confucianism, or Shinto. Kavanaugh's main point is not that religion does not exist, but that the line between what is and is not a religion is more blurry than most people realize. We really cannot entirely separate out religion from secular, political, or cultural ideas. All of these often bleed onto each other and affect how we see other facets of life. Just as Wright and Kuh note, the tenets of a particular faith, like that of Christianity, can often be paired with other aspects that are not central to Christianity or unique to it. When it comes to war, it's impossible to separate political from religious motivators. Numerous facets motivate people, and merely noting Christianity is associated with violence doesn't mean Christian beliefs cause the violence. Nor does the evidence indicate the decline of Christianity and the rise of secular states showed a decrease in violence. Kavanaugh notes in Europe, the opposite seems to have happened. It is impossible to paint the wars of Christian Europe as ever divided on religious lines. For example, after the Reformation, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V spent most of his time following Martin Luther's excommunication, not at war with Lutherans, but at war with the Pope himself. In the early decades of the Reformation, Catholic France spent most of its time at war with the Holy Roman Empire. Most of Charles' soldiers were Protestant mercenaries. Many Protestant princes joined Charles V when he went to war with the Protestant Schmal Celtic League. The Thirty Year War was not divided on religious lines either. France joined the side of the Protestants against the Holy Roman Empire, which even had the blessing of the Pope. Ernst von Mansfield began working for the Spanish and then switched to the Lutheran side, but then switched sides again, always going to the highest bidder. Sweden's Protestant king was often seen as an invader by both Protestants and Catholics within Germany. Michel de Montaigne remarked that, if anyone should sift out of the army, even the average loyalist army, those who march in it for the pure zeal of affection for religion, he could not make up one complete company of men-at-arms out of them. This is a brief sample from the many examples Kavanaugh provides of European wars not divided on religious lines. The idea of religion was the sole or main motivator for these wars is far from the truth. Other factors like politics, economics, or cultural reasons were the main motivators for the wars throughout Europe and are often the main motivators for war in general. In fact, the main problem was that during this period, power was being transferred from the church to the state. The process of secularization actually led to an increase of war and violence, not a decrease. Gabriel Arden has demonstrated that in the period of European state building, where power was being moved from the church to central governments, a period of violence occurred due to resistance to this consolidation of power. In other words, as more secularization and consolidating power in central governments increased, it didn't reduce the violence that Christianity allegedly created. It was actually a factor that led to an increase in violence. As Kavanaugh says, the transfer of power from the church to the state was clearly a cause, not the solution, of the violence of the 16th and 17th centuries. The idea that the liberal state solved the wars of religion is even more implausible than the absolutist version of the myth, because in historical fact, the liberal state does not appear until much later. We must conclude that the myth of the wars of religion is finally incredible, which is to say false. A significant portion of the violence was between members of the same church, and members of different churches often collaborated. It is impossible to separate religious motives from political, economic, and social causes, and the idea that the advent of the state solved the violence ignores abundant evidence that state building was perhaps the most significant cause of violence. Similarly, Historian Nathan Johnstone notes the use of torture in the Middle Ages did not result from an increase of Christian religiosity, but secularization within Europe. Between the end of the Roman Empire and the late 12th century, torture had fallen into disuse in Europe. Christendom owed its reintroduction not to bloodthirsty clerics, 
but to scientific jurists concerned to free justice from the reliance on God's intervention and to champion human judicial competence. In both medieval Europe and modern-day America, then, societies that had abandoned torture contemplated its reintroduction as a rational necessity. But the medieval story, that one for which we know the ending, recounts the failure of rationalism to control its own offspring. In other words, torture came about when societies began moving away from Christian doctrines and religiosity, not because Christian religiosity caused people in the Middle Ages to engage in torture. Now, this is not to say secularization necessarily leads to war and violence. Following Kavanaugh, we can note there are numerous factors that cause people to be violent or start wars. However, the evidence supports the notion that the factor of Christian religiosity seems to not be a major cause of war and violence, if at all. In reality, given the historical context, secularization might be more likely to correlate with war and violence. As Janet R. Jacobson says, The secular is not less violent than the religious. In fact, it is more so. It is a source of greater, more intense, and more intractable violence than our religious practices, communities, or worldviews and commitments. Religion, in and of itself, does not promote violence any more than secularism, in and of itself, promotes peace. Just as some of the most horrendous militarism and violence in the history of our ever smaller world has been religiously motivated, so as some of the most grand and most successful efforts for peace and peaceful social change have been religiously grounded. Similarly, the most horrific and deadly wars of the 20th century, particularly the two world wars, were pursued by putatively secular nation states. When we look at the data, it is hard to say Christianity is a cause of war and violence. In fact, the data suggests the opposite is true. The more one holds to the tenets and beliefs of Christianity, the less likely they are to resort to violence. Just because some people have claimed they acted out violently because of a Bible verse they took out of context, that doesn't mean Christianity is the real motivator of their actions. Post hoc rationales are a common practice in human psychology. Additionally, humans are capable of finding reasons for violence, and Christianity is not some special ideology that has been shown to lead to violence. The data indicates the opposite is more likely to be the case. So regardless of what someone thinks the Washington Times says, Christianity is not the bloodiest religion out there, nor is there sufficient evidence that it leads to violence.